Okay, everyone. Um, good afternoon. I'm Marion Bittler, and I'm the interim director. I'm a professor of economics, and I'm the interim director of the Institute for Social Sciences here at UC Davis. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our first new lecture of the year, which we are pleased to co-host with the Hemispheric Institute of the Americas, or HIA. The new lecture series aims to spotlight topical, cutting-edge social sciences research taking place on our campus by offering faculty members the opportunity to present their work to a broad interdisciplinary audience. And this year, we're focusing on professors who are new to UC Davis, and some of them are new to being a professor as well. Uh, some of them are not. The new lectures are just one of many events that are hosted or supported by ISS, and if you want to stay up to date on these and other things, as well as the most latest social science news and funding opportunities, check out our amazing website and subscribe to our newsletter, and you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, I'd like to draw your attention to the other new lectures that are happening this fall. On November 2nd, our speaker will be Assistant Professor of Political Science, Lauren Young. On November 17th, once again, in conjunction with HIA, we'll be hearing from Associate Professor of Anthropology, Randy Haas. And on November 27th, Associate Professor of Communications, Magdalena Wojciszek, um, I had to write that down, will deliver our final noon lecture of the quarter. So I hope you'll join us for at least one of these other talks. And this afternoon, our speaker is Santiago Perez. Assistant Professor of Economics here at UC Davis. Dr. Perez earned his PhD at Stanford University and his Master's in Economics at the Universidad de San Andres in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He's a faculty affiliate of the UC Davis Migration Research Cluster, and his areas of specialization include economic history, development economics, and labor economics. His current work focuses on historical social mobility and on the labor market outcomes of international immigrants. His paper, The South American Dream, Mobility and Economic Outcomes of First and Second Generation Immigrants in 19th Century Argentina, is forthcoming at the Journal of Economic History. And this quarter, he's teaching an undergraduate course entitled Economics of International Immigration. As he presents a lecture entitled Intergenerational Occupational Mobility Across Three Continents, Were the Americas Exceptional? Please join me in welcoming Santiago Perez. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very excited to be here and thanks for the invitation. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about this paper. It's called uh, Intergenerational Occupational Mobility Across Three Continents. And this is you know, one of the chapters of my dissertation. So I'm very excited to be sharing this with, with all of you. So let me start by, by drawing some, some introduction and some motivation. And the motivation is coming from the fact that observers in the 19th century pointed to this exceptional social mobility of the United States. And because this is a social sciences audience, I will, I will quote Karl Marx, who said that, in contrast to Europe, in the United States, social classes uh, have not yet become fixed, but continually change and interchange their elements in constant flux. Indeed, some, some research, research in economic history, this article by, by Jason Logan Chow Ferry in 2013, shows that when comparing the U.S. to Britain in the 19th century, indeed the U.S. had higher rates of intergenerational occupational mobility. What I try to ask in this paper is where these high levels of mobility of the U.S. in the 19th century were a reflection of American exceptionalism or rather, where they reflected more widespread differences between countries in Europe and some of the new settled economies of the new world. So what I do to, to answer this question is to compare rates of intergenerational occupational mobility across four countries in the 19th century. These four countries are Argentina, the United States, Britain, and Norway. And the choice of countries is primarily driven by the issues of data availability, but I, let me emphasize that these comparisons are, are, are in many ways, I think, interesting. Uh, in particular, when we think about the comparison between Argentina and the US, these are countries that in the 19th century shared many of the characteristics that have been argued with that, that to make the US a particularly mobile society in the 19th century. So these was, was, were areas of recent European settlement that featured a large frontier, uh, that was not uh, fully exploited economically, and that also, uh, and yeah, yeah that's, that's what I have to say about that. And in particular, I, I'm going to be focusing on the extent to which a father occupation provides an advantage in obtaining an occupation in adulthood for a son. So uh, this is our intergenerational occupational mobility. Uh, to answer this question, I'm going to bring a new data that I built uh, in the course of writing my dissertation, which in which I link fathers and sons across historical censuses of Argentina in the 19th century, 
And then I'm going to combine this data with very similarly constructed data from three other countries, the US, Britain, and Norway, that I'm, I'm basically uh, borrowing from, from, from previous studies. What I want to show, what I want to find in this paper, is that Argentina and the US indeed look quite similar in terms of social mobility in the second half of the 19th century. Moreover, I find that Argentina and the US had higher levels of mobility than, the, than Britain and Norway, so I also find a, a striking similarity between Britain and Norway in terms of social mobility in the 19th century. So this seems to suggest some, some sort of new old world divide in terms of, of social mobility. I want to argue that the reason, or and, and I want to be very clear on, on, on this, that I'm going to be able to, I, I'm going to be better at discarding some of the explanations that have been proposed before than at providing convincing evidence for one particular uh, explanation. But I think that, you know, after, I'm going to be able to discard many of the hypotheses that have been provided before for why these mobility levels were different across these places. And I end up concluding that part of it likely reflects this rapid expansion of towns and cities that characterize both the US and Argentina in this time period. Then, if I have time, which I probably won't, I'm going to talk about uh, why differences in rate of social mobility within Argentina across regions of the country, and this is probably not going to be uh, part of, of, of the talk today, but I just want to mention because it's something I, I've been doing. So, this paper is going to make uh, I think three main contributions. So the first is to the study of comparative intergenerational mobility in, in, in history. And in this paper, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use consistent data methodologies uh, to, 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 to add a, a Latin American country to, to its comparison. So essentially, if you look at this literature, it's really focusing on the United States and Europe. Uh, this is true both for the economic history literature, with, with some, some small exceptions, but also in the sociological literature and in the history literature, this is very much focused on, you, on the United States and Europe. At the same time, I think <coughs> one of the advantages of combining a, a number of different countries is that this is also going to allow me to do some progress on why these rates of social mobility might have differed across places. And again, as, as I told you before, I'm still going to have only four observations, in a sense. So I'm not going to be able to really nail down what, what are the causal mechanisms uh, driving the differences, but I think I'm going to provide uh, some suggestive evidence on, on, on some directions. The second strand of the literature is a literature on, on, on historical social mobility in Argentina. And, and this is a literature that is mainly uh, coming from, from history. There are a number of studies that look at this issue, uh, and however, uh, this study is going to be the first that uses a data that has national coverage, that is I'm going to include uh, potentially everyone in the country. And in particular, one key difference with previous studies is that in previous studies, uh, they were looking at local areas, and in particular, they were not following people that were moving out of these local areas. So, and we might expect that the uh, patterns of social mobility to we to be quite distinct from people that migrate internally compared to people that you know, stay in a given city for a long period of time. Of course, uh, I, I think that really the key contribution is, the, is this comparative analysis that, that helps place Argentine social mobility in a, in a, in a broader international uh, context. The third contribution is, is sort of related to the work of Peter Lindert here, is this, you know, to the study of comparative inequality in the 19th century. This is, you know, there's a lot of research uh, on, on comparative inequality that you know, Peter and co-authors have been doing. This is looking at sort of, a, 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 and, and this is on cross-sectional inequality. My paper is, is on this dynamic uh, uh, social mobility, okay? So the outline is going to be the following. I'm going to uh, give you some details about how to build the data. I'm not going to give you all of the details that you probably like to hear for data for time constraints but I'm happy to, to take questions on that. Then I'm going to explain how I measure mobility and what I mean by mobility in this setting. Then I'm going to be presenting the main results on, on, on this comparison across four countries of intergenerational mobility, and in the final, if I have time, which I think I want, I'm going to talk about uh, regional differences in mobility in Argentina. So let me talk about the data. So what I'm going to do is to combine the data that I did myself uh, for the purposes of my dissertation, as I have used in, in other projects, uh, in which I linked the 1869 and 1895 uh, Argentine censuses of population. And I'm going to combine this, this data with three similarly constructed uh, 
data sets for three other countries. The United States from 1850 to 1880, Britain from 1851 and 1881, and Norway from 1865 and 1900. <coughs> I want to emphasize that, you know, of course, you, you might have the, the concern that if these data sets are not similarly constructed, then we might be confounding sort of true differences in mobility across places with differences in how these data sets were built. I think these data sets overall are, are quite similar in terms of their construction. So they are all linked national census of population. So this is important, the fact that they are national, because they are, in all of the cases, uh, that the researchers are going to be able to follow internal immigrants. The second, and this is uh, quite important and, and, and sort of a delicate issue, is that the linking is going to be based on names of place of birth and year of birth. These are the characteristics that are first non-unique. So there are a lot of Santiago Perez born in 1984 in, 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 in let's say, in Buenos Aires. At the same time, this is prone to enumeration and transcription error. And this will become clear once I show you one of the pictures. But in the sense that you know, people are going to make mistakes in reporting their ages, that people are going to report their names, uh, and then the, the census enumerator will transcribe their names. So these are all potential sources of mistakes. Another similarity between the census is that you know, I'm going to have a relatively similar uh, number of years between uh, one, when occupation is measured for the father and when occupation is measured for the son. And this is going to be important because if there is, we, we want to get a sense of how, how mobility com uh, compares uh, with, with respect to sort of the permanent occupation of the person, the sort of the last occupation uh, that the person is having. This is the last, it's sort of perhaps a more technical point, but it's, I think, important to mention it, is that the first on links are, in all cases, based on co-residence on the initial year. So the only way that I'm going to able to, to build the first on links in the initial year is by looking at fires and sons that are co-residing on the same household on the initial year. And this might be important to, to have in mind because people that do not live with their parents by the age of 16 might be different than people who do live with their parents by the age of 15, and their patterns of mobility might be different. But in, in all of these data sets, we are really looking at intact households. So households that, you know, by the time that the kid is 16, uh, he's still living with his father. So let me sort of illustrate a bit you know, the data construction and also the challenges of the data construction. So this is the 1869 Argentine census of population. And here, uh, I'm going to start from, from looking at the father and identifying the occupation of the father. So this is a person that is called uh, Ramon Bautet, uh, who was born in France and who dedicates himself to, to commercial. So he's a commerciant, a storekeeper. In the same census, in the same page of the, of the census manuscripts, I'm going to observe his son, who is called Alejandro, who was born in Argentina in the province of Frente Rios and who is eight years old. And, and this is why I, I really, uh, yeah, and this is why uh, this is based on coresidence, because the only way I'm, I'm building these links in the first step is by, by having people that are living together. What I'm going to do next is to look for Alejandro in the 1895 census of population. And with some imagination, uh, you should see that you know, this is Alejandro Botet, uh, who is 35 years old, uh, who still was, is born in Entre Rios, and who, in this case, is doing the same as his father. Although, you know, to be very clear, I'm not using the occupation as one of the elements uh, in the link. As you see, you know, one of the challenges is that you know, understanding this handwritten manuscript is, is of course, not straightforward. And the other is that, you know, if you are fast at math, you will notice that this kid used to be 8 years old, and then 26 years later, this kid is 35. And, again, my algorithm is going to try to accommodate for the fact that people at this time period tended to run their ages, and I'm going to sort of, you know, allow for some, are going to give me some slack in terms of, 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 of allowing for differences in, 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 in age. Then the issue is, okay, after we link all of these people, uh, then we need to decide on, on how to classify these occupations. So these occupations are really extreme variables. So I have, you know, this person is a comerciante. And of course, there are hundreds of these occupations in the data. So we need some way of summarizing all of this information into, into some uh, simple categories that we can work with. 
I'm going to follow a relatively standard classification that it's, it's now quite, quite wide, widespread. Uh, it's quite used in the economic history literature, which is this thing called the Heath class classification. And in my baseline analysis, and this is uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is that I want uh, the results to be comparable to some previous literature. And also, uh, it's really hard to go even finer than this in the sense that uh, and, and preserve comparability across places. So in the recent analysis, I'm going to be looking at four uh, main occupational categories, which are uh, white-collar, farmer, uh, skill, semi-skill, uh, and skill. Just to give you an example of what these categories mean, so a white-collar worker will be a commerciante, so Ramon Botet will be a white-collar worker, and also his son. A farmer, well, you all know what, it, what, what a farmer is. Uh, a skill, semi-skill, will be, uh, think of a carpenter, a shoemaker, and unskilled, think of a laborer. The next challenge is uh, so, uh, are, the, are the occupations uh, re within a certain list of group or they are like description no, no. of the so jobs? No, no. So occupations are really whatever the person wanted to say. Okay. So, so this is. was a, a, a real pain to, to so clean. So I had to I had to clean exactly. all this data, and I basically and basically what I did then is to map. So there, there's there's. Uh, the people that did his class also did something called the historical di the dictiona dictionary of occupational titles. And basically what, what you can do there is you enter the string in different languages, and then it will give you a code, a HISCO code, and then there is a mapping between these codes and the his class category. So basically there's one step zero in which I clean the data quite a bit. Then there is a step one in which I pass this data through this dictionary, and then it gives me uh, occupational uh, codes. And then I use this mapping to map those into, into social classes or, or occupational categories. OK, so how, how, how to measure mobility? So this is sort of you know, an, another uh, specificity of this context. So economists are used to think about measuring uh, mobility by looking at intergenerational correlations in income. So basically they take the income of, of in one generation and take the income in the generation after and then they look at the correlation of those two and if this correlation is very high they conclude that mobility is low and if this correlation is very low they conclude that mobility is high. In this setting it's not possible to look at that and the reason is that we do not observe individual level income. We only observe occupations. So there, there are no questions on how much these people are making. And really, to, to, to be completely honest, even in, the, in this setting, if you had that question answered, it would be, you know, the answer to that would probably not be too meaningful for farmers, for instance. So it would be really hard to, 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 to measure these intergenerational correlations in income in this setting. So what I'm going to focus is on intergenerational occupational mobility. And, and this is of interest in the social sciences more broadly, so this is what you know, sociologists have usually been interested about. And again, I want to emphasize that it's, it's, it's not ex ante clear that, that we should care more about one or the other. But, but again, the, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm reporting only occupational and not both is that I, I cannot really measure uh, uh, this, this income mobility. So just to, to give you an idea of, of, of how the data that then looks is, you know, I'm going to build some occupational transition matrix in which I have the occupation of a father, then I have the occupation of the son, and then the father, and then this is a simple example in which there are only two occupational categories. So let's say that, you know, this is telling me, you know, among, there, there were 20 white collar workers and 15 uh, there are 20 white collar workers, and among the sons of them, uh, 15 of them are also white collar workers, 5 are farmers, and, and among the children of farmers, 10 of them uh, are white collar workers, 70 of them are farmers. So, re this is, you know, this type of transition matrix is the object that I'm going to be dealing with uh, in, in throughout the talk. The next issue is, OK, I'm going to build this for Argentina. I'm going to build this for the, US, for the US, Britain, Norway. OK, so how do we compare all these matrices across places? OK, there are potentially many numbers in each of these matrices, so we, we, we kind of want to get some summary measure of mobility. The simplest measure that is sometimes called the total mobility rate is a very natural one, which is, OK, what fraction of the sons are in a different occupational category than their father? And this is a very intuitive measure, 
So in this example, this uh, number M is 15%. So there are, among the children of farmers, there are 10 of them who are white collar workers. And, and among the children of white collar workers, there are five of them who are farmers. So overall, 15% of the sons are working on a different occupational category than their father. What is the problem with this measure? Is that this measure doesn't really allow me to distinguish whether these differences are due to the relative frequencies of occupations across matrices. I'm going to give you an example where this will be very clear. Or differences in the strengths of this row column association. And this is what I want to call equality of opportunity. So the extent to which having a father in a given occupation gives you an advantage in accessing a given occupation in adulthood. So let me uh, illustrate wh why this measure, while it sounds very intuitive, uh, has an important limitation. So imagine that we have two countries that really have a quality of opportunity, in the sense that regardless of your father's occupation, your probability of landing a given occupation in adulthood is the same. So in country P, uh, about 20% uh, of you know, if, if your father is a white collar, you have a 20% chance of becoming also a white collar worker. Because that's 4 divided by 20. If your father is a farmer, you also have a 20% chance of becoming a white collar worker. Okay, so this country seems to have quite a, 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 quite a high level of equality of opportunity. So the occupation of your father is totally unpredictable, unpredictable about uh, your future occupation. In this country, this total mobility rate is 32%. Okay, this is 16 plus 16. Let's take another uh, hypothetical country, country Q. And in this country, also the occupation of a father does not give you any, uh, doesn't give you any advantage to, to land in a given job in adulthood. So if your father is a white collar worker, you have a 50% chance of being a white collar worker or a farmer. If your father is a farmer, you have a 50% chance of being a white collar worker or a farmer. However, this total mobility rate is 50% in this country, okay? So these are two countries that, you know, in some deep sense, we think of having the same levels of equality of opportunity. However, this simple measure is going to give us a very dis different uh, uh, perspective or a very different conclusion when comparing the two. So what I'm going to do is to measure is to basic comparisons on the cross product ratios across matrices. Okay, and let me slow down here because this might be somewhat confusing. But basically, the measure that I'm going to use is going to be based on the ratio between two, uh, two ratios. One is that the odds that the sons of white collar workers get a white collar shop rather than a farming shop. And I'm going to divide that by the odds that the sons of farmers get a white collar shop rather than a farming shop. So if you're in a setting with a quality of opportunity, this, uh, this ratio should be 1. So the odds that you are a white collar, the odds that you get a white collar shop rather than a farming shop if your father is a white collar worker should be the same as the odds that you get a farmer shop rather than a white collar shop if your father is a farmer. And we see that using this sort of more fundamental measure of, 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 of mobility, we see that country P and country Q are really looking the same. These are two countries that have perfect equality of opportunity. So if we only had two occupational categories, a very natural measure of, of the amount of mobility in a place would be how far are these cross product ratios from one. So if the cross product ratio in a country is one, this means that the country has equality of opportunity, if it is very far from one, it means that this country is very far from equality of opportunity, which means that uh, mobility levels in that place are quite low. Things become a bit more complicated when we have more than two occupational categories, and the reason is that there are many possible, there are many of these possible erasures. So we need to come up uh, with a way of aggregating all of these uh, different uh, cross ratios into some uh, summary measure. And here, uh, what I'm going to do is use uh, this uh, a statistic called the Altam statistic that really what, what all it's doing is just aggregating all of these differences in cross product ratios across places. So really, uh, all we are interested about here is comparing these mobility matrices P and Q across two places, or, or this could also be time periods, for instance. 
And what I'm going to do is to compute these cross product ratios and take, take the difference across the two matrices and then sum up those, uh, some, some weighted measure of those uh, uh, across all the possible uh, combinations. There are some useful properties of this statistic, but really the, the, the one is that, that this can be decomposed, so we can learn which of the specific cross product ratios are explaining, are driving the differences. And the way I'm going to proceed is to first, let's, I want to take two countries, and I'm going to compute this Altam statistic. And, I, and I'm going to first try to see whether the mobility patterns in the two places are different. So I want to test whether this uh, DPQ is actually different from zero. And then what I'm going to do is to measure the distance of each of these matrices with respect to a matrix that represents full independence. Okay, where full independence is a case in which the occupation of a father does not predict the occupation of a son, and you should think of a matrix representing full independence as, as a matrix of ones. Okay, so really uh, all of what I'm going to be showing you is how far the mobility matrix of each of these countries is from a mobility matrix that represents full independence. And again, the higher the value of this statistic, the lower the mobility, the further away uh, the cross product ratios are from the ratios that, 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 we, that we would predict after uh, uh, with independence. Okay, so if this so, was. So yeah, this yeah. measure of mobility that you are telling us is just a measure of, uh, you can define this for any cells uh, of staying in the cell of going across. It has no directionality, that's what I want to. So there is no sense in there which is no this is, uh, you can tell something about upward or downward that's, in the way that we can say that's, within That's cancer. absolutely correct. So um, this measure doesn't have any uh, ordering in, into it. And the reason why, the, uh, I, I think this is sensitive for this time period, in the sense that we, I mean, we, it's, it's very unclear example how you would order these categories in, the, in this setting. So it seems relatively uncontroversial that the unskilled category would be at the bottom. Mm -hmm. That's relatively uncontroversial. Then once you go move away from that, it's a bit hard. So farmers is a very broad occupational category that in, in the case of Argentina, for instance, would include people you know, owning half the country with you know, people that are not very rich. Uh, so it's very it's it's unclear that being a farmer is necessarily worse than being a commerciante in this setting. So mm -hmm. that's in that sense, uh, uh, because there's no data on, on average incomes that we can reliably build for, for, for this. It's it's really at the end of the day we, we are we, we choose to not rank these occupations and only look at, at this uh, yo. Yeah, this unordered, uh, unordered Sorry, uh, so the order is one, and the other is also there is no distance between these cells, in a sense, uh, yeah. as a consequence. Of, right. So is there a way of modifying this uh, so that you don't have full symmetry? So moving from A to B is a bigger move, I whatever see. it means, that moving from right. A to C in terms of jobs. I see, I see what you're saying. So I, I, I think that in order to get at that, you will need some some scale in which you are ordering the occupations that has, that has both an order and some cardinality to it, right? So you need that, you know, if you, if you think about income, that's very natural, you know, it's everyone on a, on a, on a, on a line, and then the distance is, you know, how far you are. Uh, here it's a bit unclear. So, this is a, some conversation. Okay, Go, no, no. There is a, some discussion, uh, there were, there's some, a common article on, on the long and furry article, and some measure that people have used, which I found a little bit uh, that, that I do not like too much, is that you know, one way to look at how, let's is looking at the frequency of transitions as a way of, of capturing this difficulty of, of transitions. So maybe you say, okay, if very few people are going from unskilled to white collar, this might be a quite, quite, a, quite a big chunk. Mm -hmm. The problem is that you are sort of it's, it's very tautological in the sense that you know everything is based on the same transition, so you you do not really have any outside measure uh, beyond what you what you are already observing in the data. So in that sense, it's you know that's one possible solution, but I think it's not fully satisfactory. Okay. Yeah, Yana. Um, how do you, so do the countries vary in terms of the number of categories, and how do 
this shape. So, so the number of categories is, is a choice that I make in the sense that I, I decide to categorize occupations into four uh, broad groups. I have four, so there is no variation. Across. And there are, yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in all the countries I choose four groups. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, otherwise, it, so you, you need the matrix to have the same dimension to, to compare them mm -hmm. it, with this measure. Yeah. Sorry. Is each sun an independent, if a, if, a, if a person has more than one sun, is each sun an independent observation? Yeah. Okay, so this is really the sort of the core of, of, of the paper is, is the, are these comparisons across the four countries. And just just to, to show you how, how this looks in the data, so this is the transition matrix from Argentina. I have about twenty thousand father son pairs. And again, just, just to show you how to read this, so this you know if, if your father is a white collar worker, uh, about fifty percent remain in the white collar category, about twenty percent that become farmers, twelve percent become go to this skill semi skilled category, 15% are unskilled workers. Similarly, we see that you know, farming is also quite persistent in, in, the, in the main diagonal, so people that have a father in farming are also quite likely to remain in that category. And, and you know, again, there are many numbers, I'm not going to go uh, through each of them, but something that I'm not going to do because it, it's a bit hard to, to, to do in, in a presentation, but if you, if you look at the raw data of the US and the Argentine matrices, they actually look quite similar. So it's, 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 it's quite striking how similar the two matrices are. But I'm not, not going to show that because it's a bit hard to, to see in a, in a presentation. And, and these are the difference. This is, this is, I think, really the main findings is that you know, there was higher mobility in Argentina and the US than in Norway and Britain. This is true both if we use this more. Uh, let's say a conventional or straightforward measure of mobility. So this is the fraction of sons in a different occupation than the father. This was in the order of 50 something percent for Argentina. We see this ranking uh, going, uh, starting you know Argentina with the highest mobility, and no, uh, US, Norway, UK. However, I want really to focus on this measure that I think is more appropriate, which is this distance of the mobility matrix with respect to independence. And we see that there is this very sharp uh, you know, similarity between the US and Argentina. They look quite similar uh, and have an Alton statistic of about uh, 12. And the, U the UK and Norway, they also look quite similar to each other and also and have a much lower uh, levels of mobility. Okay, and, and, and to, to get a sense of magnitude, this means that, that, that the deviations from, 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 from independence are about twice as large in, the, in, in Britain and Norway than in Argentina and the US. Okay, and, and, and again, there, there's a table version of that in which I show that you know, everything, all the differences are statistically significant, so you know, just to, I think this is a more transparent way of showing it, but you know, bear in mind that everything is, is, is precisely measured. This is a table that has too many numbers, probably, but uh, let, me, let me try to explain what this means. So one of the, one of the nice features of this atom statistic is that we can decompose it. So we can uh, try to understand uh, what fraction of, of the difference between two places are coming uh, from, 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 from which comparisons. We see that when we look at the Argentina versus Britain comparison, a lot of it seems to be coming from the fluidity between uh, farming and unskilled work. So in the US, in Britain, if your father was a farmer, the probability that you were a farmer relative to an unskilled worker, uh, relative to the probability of an unskilled worker, was 48, 48. So the children of a farmer was 48 times more likely to be a farmer than an unskilled worker than the children of an unskilled worker. And in Argentina, this number is not too high. If we look at Argentina versus Norway, uh, are, it, it, the sources are not, are not coming from exactly the same. So we see that, for instance, the fluidity with which people enter white collar shops in Argentina was higher than in Norway. Uh, and, and we see that, for instance, you know, if, uh, one example would be this one. So in Norway, if your father was a white collar worker, uh, you had uh, relative that your father being an unskilled worker, then you have that you know the, the chances of you being a white collar worker were 62 times 
more than the chances of an unskilled worker. And here, what I do is to you know to just show uh, what you know what are the small differences between Argentina and the U.S. coming. But let let me move on for for the sake of time, and and let me I think one of the things that I like the most about the paper is that I think we can make some progress in understanding uh, why were these mobility levels higher um, in, in the new world, or, or at least in these two countries of the new world. One very natural explanation is that this is just driven by, by, by the higher proportion of the foreign born in the US and Argentinian population. So it's very natural to think that first generation immigrants that initially face a penalty in the labor market when, when we look at their kids, they're going to be, uh, it will look like they have moved up relative to their kids. So if you have a population that has a much higher uh, share of, of the foreign born, then we might see higher mobility levels in that, in, in that, in, in that country, but you know, this might just be driven by, by the different fraction uh, of, 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 the, of, of immigrants in the population. However, I show that if I directly exclude immigrants from the Argentine and U.S. samples, the results look pretty much the same. So basically, I recompute all these numbers, excluding the foreign born from the sample, and everything looks, looks very similar. So it doesn't seem that more first-generation immigrants is really the explanation. The other side of this migration story is that, uh, of course, one difference between Argentina and the U.S. and Britain and Norway is that this country had less immigrants. So, all of these findings could be explained by a sample selection story. So I'm only observing the people have, that choose to stay in Britain and Norway. I do not observe the people that move to the US, for instance. So it could be that the most mobile new old world populations move to, to a new world, and the ones that were left are the ones that are less mobile. So it could be that mobility overall was quite high in Europe once we, uh, you know, take a, a broader perspective and, and, look, and, and follow these suns uh, across the ocean. What I do is to, is to do a bounding exercise in which I say, well, okay, if these kids that left Europe had perfect mobility, what, how would mobility rates look in Europe? Okay, so this is giving me an upper bound of the amount of mobility that we could have observed in Europe. Between the overall and the new world, so I read somewhere just anecdotally that candle makers have a much higher real wage in the United States than in than the, I mean than they had in Britain when they left. Yeah. So, I mean, does that have anything to do with? I, I, so, so here I'm not really looking at wages. So I'm looking at occupational transitions. Yes. So it, it, you know, it's not. Uh, but does the real wage of the parent have anything to do with the mobility of the child? I see. So you're saying that. You're, yeah, but then you, I, I think that that wouldn't be consistent with the story in the sense that, that Argentina was, was probably not richer than, than Britain at this time. So I, I'm, I'm seeing that Argentina had higher levels of mobility than Britain, so that would be a bit against, uh, you know, this coming through resources in the family. And also it's unclear that, that higher levels of wealth will generate higher mobility in the sense that it, it would have to be combined with some inequality story in which, you know, inequality levels were lower also in the new world, and because of that... Exactly. Yeah. So, but can we say whether the skilled wage in Argentina is higher than the skilled wage in Britain? With some degree of noise, but yes, yes some, some, and, and, and if you look at Argentina versus Britain, you do not see, it's, it's not true that at, at this time period Argentina had higher wages. It's true for the, for the U.S., but not for Argentina. So Argentina had lower wages than the U.S. And, and, and again, what, what I do here is to sort of assume perfect mobility among those who left. So this, this gives me an upper bound of the amount of mobility that the, popu that the initial population could have experienced. And I see that, you know, unless the fraction of people leaving the country was massive, which, which, which was large, but not, not, to, to, you know, not to the level that I would need to rationalize these patterns. Another, and this is also related to the work of Peter, is this, you know, this idea of better public schooling in the new world. So this is one explanation that has been suggested. So this idea that the U.S. had much early on a widespread public school availability, 
and that this might explain why the US ha was a more mobile society than, than the UK. Argentina is really a counterexample to that because the you know, rates of, of, child, of school attendance in 1869 were extremely low. So it's not true that you know, in the, these kids were not going to school at higher rates than those in Britain. So if anything, they were much less likely to go to school. This is you know, per perhaps related to Kathy's point, this you know, differences in inequality across places. And, and this is where I don't have uh, great evidence, but I think that the scatter evidence, so this idea of the Great Gatsby Curve, so this idea that countries that have a higher inequality are also going to have lower mobility. So you know, perhaps this is reflecting uh, lower mobility or so lower inequality in the new world relative to Europe. So this really, this story would require inequality in Argentina and the U.S. to be lower than in Britain and Norway in, in the in this time period. And I think that we do not have strong evidence that this was the case. But but Peter might might might, might correct me on that. But I think that, yeah. Ashish. Can you, so, so can you look at this by geography? Like, does this have anything to do with the fact that there are large like frontier areas mm -hmm. in the U.S. where occupation is not well defined? Like, if you looked at just the original thirteen colonies or something, would it? Would I, 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 I will I will do some of that. Yeah. So the, the sort of one of the main criticisms to to the, this previous research comparing the U.S. and Britain was this issue that they were really comparing countries that were at different, at very different stages of the industrialization process. So they were comparing uh, the United States in 1850, which in which 50 percent of the population were in farming, to 1851 Britain, where less than 10 percent of the population were in farming. So while this atom statistic is, is correcting for differences in the, in, in the size of occupational categories, one argument is that maybe the people that were self-selective into being farmers in Britain by 1850 were quite, in, quite immobile. Because you know, you know, when, when only a very small fraction of the population is doing that, if you are still doing that by 1851, maybe, there's, you, know, maybe you have a comparative advantage in farming. And so you're not going to be uh, exiting this occupation. So maybe this is, you know, maybe this is all driven by farmers and by the different size of the farming sector. I'm going to argue that this is not likely the reason because if you look at Norway, it had a very similar occupational structure than Argentina and the U.S. at the time. So a lot of people were doing farming in Norway, and we see that. Uh, that social mobility in Norway looked quite similar to that in, in the U.K despite this very different occupational structure. So here is looking at the, at the father's generation and looking at the fraction of people that are doing farming, and we see that in the UK this is quite, quite low, but it's super high in Argentina, uh, Britain, and, uh, and Norway. So, uh, sorry, Argentina, the US, and Norway. So it, it, really, it really doesn't seem that differences in the stage of the industrialization process are, are the ones that are driving uh, these differences across countries. And I'm gonna, I think that this is more an exercise of discarding explanations, and I think that the, the, the one explanation that seems consistent uh, with, with the data, or at least it's not at odds with the data, is this idea of the U.S. of and of Ar and Argentina's frontier economies. So this idea of, of of a place in which new cities are created uh, and and the existing ones are ex very rapidly expanding. So you know, one example is that you know towns that have more than that 2,000 or more people go from, go from being 56 to being uh, more than 100 in, in this very short period. You know, the city of Rosario uh, quadruples its population over a 26 years period. The city of Chicago increased population by 10. And this is sort of providing opportunities for occupational mobility that were not available uh, in these sort of more mature European economies. And again, I'm not going to have great evidence on this channel, but I think that is the one that, that, that is at least not at odds uh, with the data. I'm going to... I'm oh, sorry, is this a population growth argument or is it a geographical expansion? I, I think that the argument is that the, okay. there is this expansion of cities and these sort of new cities that are created are requiring occupations that uh, at, 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 at rates that were not... Uh, but not being required in places that, that were like more mature economies that were not growing as fast. So but that and would be really a population growth story because it's not the, the fact that they had a lot of area, it's the fact that they had a big uh, urbanization. It could have happened in Europe if the population was growing at the same rate or not. Yeah, I'm not sure. I only to think about it. Yeah. 
Okay, let me, you know, I, I don't have a lot of time, so, or maybe, maybe I have more to explain this. About six, seven minutes. Oh, okay, that's okay. Okay, so, robustness. So, okay, so one, one, one worry is that these higher mobility levels that I find for Argentina and the US could be because of worse data. So, you know, if mechanically I'm worse and at, at linking people in Argentina and the US than what I am at linking Britain and Norway, then mechanically I will see that these countries have higher mobility rates. That's just because, you know, these persons are not related to each other. Another small, small point, you will, maybe it's because population, population was younger, so there, there is this life cycle bias when measuring occupations. So if we are measuring the occupation of someone when this person is too young, maybe this is not the permanent occupation of the person. What I'm going to do is, to address the first point, what I'm going to do is to bias my samples towards finding less mobility in Argentina than in the other places. And the way I do that is to just keep the very good links in my sample and, 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 and basically keep everything for the other samples, okay? So I take the British sample and the Norwegian sample and I keep everyone, so I trust whatever the people did, and from my sample I exclude uh, links that were not as good uh, as, as, that were not as good. So basically, this is what I do in this table. First, I focus on exact links. So these are people that match exactly on all the pieces of identifying information. And we see, again, this is looking at the difference between uh, the Argentine matrix and independence. We see that it goes up a bit, which reflects the fact that when I concentrate on exact links, the rates of false positives go down. However, this is still very far from the levels that we see uh, that the levels of immobility that we see in the other places. So as I still see that Argentina and Britain and Argentina and Norway look still quite different with respect to mobility. Another two things I do to, to deal with this issue of false positives is to, again, always just excluding observations from the Argentine sample and keeping everyone else in the other samples. I exclude people with very frequent names because these are the people that are more likely to be erroneous through link. So I exclude people that have uh, names in their top 25% of name frequency, top 50%, etc. I still find a, a very similar pattern. Another thing I do is to uh, reweight the sample to account for selection into the link sample. So because uh, because the linking is based on these uh, pieces of information and are non-unique and prone to transcription error, the selection into a sample is not is not entirely random. So I basically reweight the sample to mimic the population in terms of observables, and I see that you know the findings are, 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 are basically still there and are actually very similar. And then I do some things to correct for differences in the Asia structure, and still you know the results uh, hold. So I think, as I as I expected, I'm not going to have time to talk about these regional differences in mobility. It's just very briefly. Uh, there is this conventional wisdom that mobility, were, mobility levels were higher in the littoral than in the interior of Argentina. So what I do here is to compute these measures separately by province of residence in 1869. So this is similar to what, what some people have done for modern uh, US data. And I find that you know, the, 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 this conventional wisdom was somewhat right in the sense that we do see that the interior, the north of the country, have low, low levels of mobility. However, we see that some places in the interior of the country are, are actually among the most mobile. So this is, you know, the places like uh, Cordoba uh, look quite mobile at the time. So this is sort of confirming, uh, to some extent, some of the previous history research, but, but adding, uh, adding a caveat to it, which is that many of the most mobile places of the country were actually in the interior of the country. So I will conclude. Basically, I think that the main, the main result in, uh, in, in taking away is that mobility was higher in Argentina and the US than and in Norway and Britain. I want to finish with some sort of puzzle, a sort of food for thought, which is that there is this idea that, that the American dream rationalizes why the US engages in less redistribution than other countries. So this is uh, you know, an argument that has been put forward in papers like Alessina La Ferrara. So this idea that in the US, because there, is, uh, such high, there are such high levels of mobility, you know, people uh, are not too worried about inequality, so they, they, do not, uh, you know, they do not charge high taxes to people. 
And you know, Argentina is sort of a counterexample to this because we see that in the past the countries seem to have had quite high levels of mobility, however, ended up engaging in much more redistribution than the US. And if you ask, you know, that this is something that is not in the slide, but I recently learned. So if you ask people uh, about you know this world value survey question about how much of outcomes are, is explained by lack by, versus how much is explained by, uh, by, by effort, Argentina is a country that stands uh, as uh, thinking that you know, most of it is due to lack. So you know, this is a case in which you know, the perceptions of people seem to have changed uh, in, in a way that really goes against what was happening in the past. So this is you know, sort of food for thought, and I'm, I'm still not sure I have the answer to that. So thank you very much for your time. And, that's all I have to say. Uh, so, well, okay, sorry, I did not clarify. I was happy with taking questions throughout the talk. <laughs> sorry, that's the economist. <laughs> but yeah, I'm ha very happy to take questions now. So it seems like you would be able to ask some of these, answer some of these questions by excluding farmers from your samples. It seems possible that they underwent urbanization earlier, um, Norway hadn't really undergone urbanization, and the non-farmers seem to stand in a more clear, hierarchically ordered system than the farmers. So have you, and, and you also showed results that some of the largest distances in um, yeah. accounting for intergenerational or interoccupational mobility was due to the farmer and skill transitions. So have you done the analysis excluding farmers? So it's, it's, so. I, I've done some of that. I think that the, the, the key problem there is that, like, is that is to when do you exclude the farmers? So do you exclude them on the initial period? Because some people are going to move in and out of farming. So this is really a, a, so it's a bit hard to think about how to exclude farmers in the sense that uh, people are in and out of farming. So there are people that are entering farming and are people that are exiting farming. So so if I exclude everyone who is entering farming, I'm potentially you know, precluding one channel of social mobility for, let's say, the unskilled. If I exclude everyone who is initial in farming, I'm going to be excluding 50% of people, which, you know, it's a bit, it would be a bit weird to, to then argue that mobility was higher after excluding 50% of the population. So that's why I think I... So I, I've done it at the department level. So, so then there is the issue of, of, of sample size. So I have 20,000 people. So I, I've done it at the department level, which is uh, there were about 300 departments at the time. So I have a, a much nice sort of detailed map of that, which it's not too different from what you see in the plot. So I think that the broad patterns are similar. Uh, but yeah. at the city level, uh, yeah, that, that, that's something that could be done. Just look at the departments that are more urban, for I see, I see. Yeah. So I see. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah, sorry for going over. I mean, I wasn't oh, expecting to get questions throughout the. It's, there are a couple hands up, so. Okay, there was another. Yep. I have a related question to that. Um, I'm a U.S. historian and I work with the U.S. Census in this era, and I know that the categories um, for farming, it will sometimes say farmer and farm laborer. Yep. And, I, and I wonder how that would kind of. Yeah, so that, that, that is dividing the data. So a farm laborer would be an unskilled worker okay. here, and a farm. Farmer will be a farmer. Yeah, we do make that distinction. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, so on that frontier question, could you do the same exercise of dividing like the US and Argentina up into sort of frontier and non-frontier areas? Like do you do that? And if you did that, would you see sort of the same mobility across those two? Or okay, so the, a, a bit the pro like the, the, there's the one one small problem there, which is that what we Okay, yeah, I, I will need to think about what, what we call the frontier. So, like, the standard definition would be the places that were unpopulated in 1869. But if I do that, then there's no people to measure there. Uh, if we look at areas that were closer to the frontier, or let's say border, border counties, uh, that, that, that could be done. But, yeah, that could be done. Yeah. But I think but in the U.S. case, the frontier is a big issue. It's a Midwest. In the U.S., it's not just population. It's also just the availability for mobility. I mean, right when your the study starts in the U.S., you know, 1848, the United States, the size of the United States grew overnight by one third, in term in terms of geographical size. And so, 
uh, yeah, and, 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 and internal migration patterns um, would surely be or, related. Or, or going the other you way. Know, and like this is also true in the case of Argentina. So Argentina goes over a large expansion of its territory in the intercensal period. In both my case and in the US case, the fraction of people that do move to these new places in this area is relatively small. So in my case, I find that ten per, only 10% of people are moving to, to the frontier, so are moving to previously uh, sort of um, not really unpopulated, but unpopulated by the white population. Uh, and this is also true in the US, that the fraction of people moving in this 30 years period to the frontier is not too large. Could you look at it the other way? Like, take places that definitely aren't frontier. So take the original 13 colonies in the US, okay. restrict to that. Would that look like Britain, or would that still look like the US? I think my, my strong intuition is that not, is that no, but, but yeah, it's something that's like easily testable. Thanks, everyone, and I'm sure if you happen to chat a little more.